Hi. Have you ever needed to run a Java virtual machine application and um, wanted some additional monitoring that wasn't there? Well, I certainly have. Something I've been working on over the past couple of years. Uh, I've not covered it in depth, but I finally have um, built a configuration that does this, and we're going to go over it today using uh, Prometheus, JMX exporter for Prometheus, and Grafana in the configuration of all this. So first of all, let's just kind of look at some of these other videos that I've done in the past on performance and health monitoring. Um, and there is one specific one in here that was done for ThingWorks, JMX Exporter, and MBeans Attributes, Tomcat and C3PO. And um, so I have already shared on this topic. Here the focus was really on getting those Tomcat or Catalina <coughs> attributes mapped in and pulled to um, to Prometheus and there's a dashboard that accompanies this and as well for ThingWorks this is about a DB connection pool uh, to get some DB connection pool specifics but I never really dove into um, the JVM um, I did kind of talk briefly about the JVM over here uh, using Visual VM um, but today we're going to look at some some additional um, configurations that I've built to have a look at this um, in the Java virtual machine. So here I'm using um, JDK machine control and if we just come and have a quick look here in the java.lang section of the mbeans browser you know we can see a bunch of interesting stuff in here. Um, a physical memory size that's used, total, total physical memory size, free physical memory size. Uh, you know some of these things are, are I would say a little bit different because we typically running the JVM application we don't necessarily know what the host uh, that we're running on what type of resources that it has so I did try to grab some of these things that we can kind of see beyond the uh, walls of the particular application try to understand what is running on the overall host because it can start to give us some uh, insights without actually monitoring the host environment itself as to what's going on there um, which can guide us to, um, there, is there some agent software that's doing updates, some antivirus or something else that might be impacting your running applications. <clears throat> um, things like number of CPU cores that are, um, that are configured on the environment, process CPU time, how much time it's been spend, uh, spending using um, uh, processing. And, um, you know, a lot of interesting things about the memory pools. Um, here we can see just different things about the Eden space, old gen, survivor space, code heap. Um, so we are going to pull these guys in. And uh, garbage collector, we're not doing anything specific on the garbage collection because the garbage collection uh, details are available in um, when we use the JMX exporter natively as, a, as an agent. Um, so that gets pulled in. There's also a bunch of threading related information that gets pulled in natively uh, as far as the thread states that we're going to leverage in the default configuration uh, into a, um, a dashboard. Um, but there are some specific things that I've had to add to the configuration over time and uh, we're going to have a look at that. So I guess just First thing is we have an address here, right? Like a JMX sort of address. So if we just kind of look at um, this one here, there's an attribute name used swap space size, and it's got a particular address as far as where we can find it. And if we just kind of hover over this, we can see java.lang equals operating system. This is the type of mbean that it is, and this is the attribute name. So basically we need to find the appropriate pattern combina combination of these two in order to, to do this. I have to say kind of up front, um, you're heading on an adventure sometimes when you do some of this stuff because depending on which JVM you're, you're using, these names and the way that we reference them can change. Um, and something like Catalina is actually quite challenging. Some of these things like the global request processor, you see you've got this nested one here for WebSocket. Um, this is one particular one that I haven't actually been able to get uh, the JMX exported to to specifically call out, despite the fact that we clearly see here um, what it's called and how to find it. So um, I'm not using wildcard configurations, um, which is I guess classic in um, the configuration for JMX, um, and the reason is because when you use wildcard configurations. Uh, 
um, we can't really provide a particular name that we want um, and so you know the names that are provided in the M beans might not be so appropriate for um, for Prometheus and uh, we want to make sure that the Prometheus metric has a relevant name uh, a relevant name that then has the appropriate labels so that we can then use the labels in Grafana to easily do things like querying using PromQL or um, drop down selectors for example if you want to have a look at a different pool or maybe you just want to have one query that's going to show a number of lines uh, in Grafana so uh, this is where this is where what we have in front of us is, is um, I don't want to say it's a black art but it is a very challenging process um, but the payoff comes when we have the Prometheus metric names uh, formatted in a, in a standard fashion with the appropriate labels associated to them, then it really becomes um, much easier to build dashboards, do alerts, and those types of things based on the environment, the application, uh, maybe the memory pool or the thread pool, uh, the thread states, things like that that you might be interested in. So this is why I'm using um, the specific the specific uh, patterns here. We can see in this top section of my configuration file here, I have a section for the JVM. And um, JVM is first looking at some of those things we saw there for the process CPU load system, CPU load load average and available processors. And this is building a metric called JVM underscore processor underscore dollar one and the dollar one is looking for this capture group here uh, so whichever of those attributes is is true it's going to populate this into the metric name now if i had more capture groups uh, or nested capture groups like one two three four i could use those here in um in the name um you know here you can see i've added something at the end for the total and um you know there's probably examples um, like here where we're using first capture group is the name of the area um, so this normally in the uh, this is called memory usage uh, yeah so it's here non-heap memory and free heap memory so and then there's also the heap memory usage and non-heap memory usage so here I'm getting the memory usage, so I want non-heap and heap. So here we're using this particular capture group to capture the heap and non-heap text um, number one. And we can see I'm putting this into a label, so there's going to be a label called heap and non-heap. And then I'm just putting this in memory bytes. Um, and, um, you know, there is some convergence in my names and metrics. This is just because I wasn't able to find anywhere the really a standard naming convention for some of these things, some places and some dashboards already use this particular one where it's bytes and then uh, followed by um, this uh, and other ones always put bytes at the end to reference the types of units that we're talking about. Uh, for example, like a count or a total or seconds. In any case, one of the nice things about doing it this way uh, is allows us to specify particular um, attributes. Normally when we do just a wildcard uh, pattern like we see down here, pattern java.star, it's going to pull everything that the Gemx exporter uh, finds. And that's certainly an easy way to do it. But if you've got 100 metrics, you know, kind of like we can see here, there's actually a lot more in this particular mbean. Um, so by naming them, um, not only does it make it readable, so that somebody looking at this configuration file knows what the uh, values are going to be inside of there um, but also it allows us to eliminate a bunch of them this particular this particular pattern or gmx query actually eliminates um, about 25 percent of the um, attributes that are in there that are unneeded and so it just allows us to keep the uh, cardinality of the prometheus metrics um, down to a to an actual usable um, amount and um, so coming back up to, to the JVM, this is really about the JVM. And so you can hear I've got seeking one, two, three, four, five. I've got five JMX queries that are grabbing and gathering some specific things that are not available in the default. Um, file descriptors, for example, can be useful. Some specifics about um, 
current thread CPU usage time. There's there's potentially other things that you might find useful in here. I've tried to kind of keep it simple, but at the same time pro provide some relevant um, things in the configuration. And once we run that in, um, you know, we should have something like along these lines where the JMX exporter is uh, exposing a number of metrics. Most of these ones we're going by here, you can see are around uh, Tomcat. But if I search for JVM underscore, sorry, control F, you know, we got a number of those ones that uh, I had those queries set up for. And um, threads, current thread CPU time, file descriptors, and then we should also come down to some of the other ones that um, yeah some of the standard ones we'll find those in a second um, but this is what essentially uh, Prometheus needs to be grabbing and pulling in and then let's come over to the dashboard so this is the dashboard in Grafana where I'm hooked into um, Prometheus to, uh, to view the data and um, starting out with the variables, I've created a number of variables here uh, with the intended purpose of being able to select different things. If you have multiple data sources, you know, having a, a data source selector always allows you to not have to change the, uh, the dashboard in order to pick a different data source. So here we can see I've only got one, um, but some people do have many of these data sources. Um, namespace, I'm not running on, on Kubernetes in this particular environment, but this is a namespace selector that's going to grab the namespace label off of the metric if it happens to have one. Uh, and then same with job and app. You can see here there's no app labels in these particular um, these particular metrics, but um, all we're doing is saying, look, there's this JMX exporter build info uh, metric, and we're going to pull some of these key labels off of there, and we're going to load them in here to these selectors. And then when we have a look at some of these queries that are being used here in the um, dashboard, uh, we're reapplying those those um, essentially parameters, the um, the variables that are up here with the promql uh, variable so that we can you know narrow it down into and get into a particular whether it be application pod or instance that we're looking at uh, so that this dashboard can be used for uh, multi-environment setup and we can kind of quickly look across a, a batch or a group of um, java applications that might be running close together uh, so it's probably not perfect, but I've tried to make it as um, easy to use depending on the runtime environment that you're using. Um, so let's start having a look at it. It's, it's, it's all built like this where we can just collapse these rows in order to kind of hide things away. We've got some key information about the JVM environment, uh, processors, free memory, used memory, um, some average heap usage, when the JVM was started, how long it's been up for, uh, what the JVM version is. This can be helpful in certain situations where you come across a problem and you realize maybe you're not using the uh, uh, compatible JVM version or there's been a new feature or some fixes that have been added. Um, file descriptors can also be quite handy. You can see I've got a lot of file descriptors here. I've optimized the server for um, being, uh, being a performance server. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be much smaller if you don't have a, have done the uh, appropriate uh, system config. Um, this can be a bottleneck, obviously, depending on what we're running. And um, so process load, this is telling us JVM process versus overall system process. This, this, as I mentioned earlier, you know, really I'm just trying to take whatever signals that I can get out of the JVM to be able to give us some form of indication if the JVM is struggling, if there's a lot of work going on inside the, uh, the JVM, or if it's something that's coming from outside of the JVM that might be impacting overall system performance. And we can see here that the two are really hugging one another, which is what we would expect to see. Um, and I don't really know how the CPU time, user time kind of associates to the running JVM application. So this one interpretation is really going to be evolution over time, right? If we see that this is normally around this level and it's kind of creeping up over the period of a month, you know, that's ind indicative of the fact that the application is doing more and more processing when we haven't really changed the load profile, so that shouldn't be happening. Um, and um, garbage collection, this is really the key section of all of this. 
I would say, and this is one of the reasons why you really need to run the JMX exporter as a Java agent, is that it's going to pull these particular metrics in here. Um, whereas, you know, you can't really get these as a HTTP server setup um, from what I've been able to, to pull together in any case. And so this is giving us the JVM GC collection seconds count here. So we get the number of um, collections that I'm looking at a rate over um, a one minute period, meaning that this is kind of giving us, um, rate is obviously per second over a one minute period. It's giving us an idea of how often the JVM is doing uh, garbage collection and then the duration over here on how long those uh, garbage collections are taking. So we can see it's quite fast. This is perfect what we'd expect. And uh, we also see that the overall throu throughput is nice and um, clean, right? It's about, uh, should be close to 100% if it's um, uh, some of our guidance is that throughput really should be above 98% uh, to have optimal performance. Otherwise, we're spending too much time doing garbage collection rather than running the application. Um, I will say that this calculation is perhaps not so perfect, um, correct or accurate, but I did my best to um, try and come up with a throughput calculation that can be tracked over time. Um, so I have seen some anomalies where you start up the application where it doesn't seem to be correct, but over time it seems to be reasonably um, comparable to a normal um, throughput calculation that you might do with GC um, log file and analysis tools. Differences. This is this is um, constant, right? And it's pulling this in and tracking it over time. And then this is just a different view of kind of the co combined um, metrics here. Is to say, okay, maybe this isn't perfect. Maybe it's not uh, correct. It's a percentage, but overall, over the particular period that we have selected, how much time are we spending doing garbage collection? So this is really just a sum of all of the garbage collection events. Um, to tell us, you know, if it's 100 milliseconds over one hour period, that's awesome. Um, it could be much longer, right? And we'll have a look at something later that, that is giving us an indication that uh, spending too much time doing garbage collection and hence things are not configured appropriately. Um, so the memory section is um, classic, right? You can see I'm in the heap. Uh, section quite large so we can do kind of more of a detailed heap um, analysis, heap memory analysis, where we've got the the committed and the um, used here, right? So nothing's going on. We can see it's building up, doing garbage collection. It frees everything up, right? So old gen, old gen is about here, right? This baseline here, this is our old gen. Uh, and then our, you know, our Eden space is is kind of what is is growing here. We are able to free the memory and uh, get things cleaned up down here as we go along, which is good and healthy pattern. Um, non heap, uh, just throwing that in there as essentially telling us some of those things that are outside of the heap. There is other memory usage that's outside of the heap that we need to be aware of. Uh, especially when we're doing resource sizing. Um, and you can see here my resource sizing isn't so great. Um, total versus used is super, super close. So this is on the physical machine, right? So the total is the total physical machine and the used uh, is uh, only a couple hundred megs off. So um, we need to be aware of the different aspects of memory and same with buffer pool, right? We do have buffer pool um, needs that we need to keep uh, in consideration when we talk about the JVM application using memory. It's it's non-heap, uh, buffer pool, and and um, and heap. So other memory pools, I did bring these in um, because I because I can, and sometimes you need to get into uh, having a look at this stuff. So it's here. It, it certainly adds a number of metrics to the um, to the pile, if you will. But we can do an analysis of the different uh, memory pools in here. And uh, normally we don't need to do that. And then we've got the threading. So here is is just some of the um, the thread states that are available when using JAMX exporter as a Java agent. And you can see <clears throat> that it gives us the possibility to to um, track trend uh, thread states counts over time. This can be really helpful when you, especially when you're looking at a high load period. Um, to sort of see how the execution is going. You know, if you do have everything that gets blocked, 
um, you'll see this here. There is this block category, uh, block thread states. So it's not exactly you know same as doing a thread dump and, and looking at the status of all the threads, but it's it's giving us an attribute from the running JVM each time the Gemx exporter is is uh, inquired. Uh, it's looking at how many block threads there are. So this can be very helpful for for indicating when you might have a performance or health issue and what time that is and, and maybe some of the other things that are happening at that time for you to go in and do a, a deeper dive into what's going on there. Loaded classes at the bottom. I've never needed to use this. Uh, a lot of the applications we use are, are quite fixed, static in the, um, the classes that are loaded, but um, that might be important for some. Um, right, a lot of stuff on here. As I mentioned, you can use these to select different things. And just as a demo on um, kind of that on a, on a more complex environment, I do have another environment up here that I've just been doing a little bit of testing with this. Um, this is kind of a weird, uh, monstrous uh, environment that um, I'm leveraging the app label um, in my Prometheus config to do the, the collection. Um, and at collection, I'm specifying which application that is. So we're applying another label, and you can see these labels here, the app labels. Um, and that app, the app label it allows me not only whether it's on one instance or whether it's on another instance to be able to uh, specifically call out a particular application, uh, whether I'm looking at an application on, on one uh, machine host or across multiple hosts. Um, so I've tried to do, that's why I mentioned, I've tried to uh, include these different tags. We can look at them across a cluster or we can look at them on a particular machine. If we look at um, uh, Skippa here, a CPA accelerator, running on ThingWorks Foundation, we can see that this is now just selected one particular running uh, JVM, but each one of these apps has its own uh, running JVM. And um, yeah, we could make this multi-select if we wanted to, um, this particular one, just by going and changing that in the, uh, in the uh, variable configuration. Um, but you can see here that the GC throughput value changed a little bit strangely. And this is because here the calculation and the selections that I've done in the queries, it's not really, it's not really applicable in this particular case. We can't really calculate throughput across whatever it is, eight different applications. So, you know, for the GC throughput things to, to work properly, you really need to specify a particular JVM. Um, and, and in doing so, it should um, give us some real numbers. And um, so this looks pretty much similar to what we saw before, but let's look so something that's a little different. Um, you know, and looking at some of these things I mentioned, being able to sort of see, you can see here a little difference in the overall system CPU and the, the JVM process CPU. We'd expect this because there's a lot of stuff running on this machine and they're kind of combining together. Um, but this guy here for this uh, windshield method server, it keeps coming down and down and down. Um, and we can see GC time is 14 minutes. So I'm not entirely sure if this is correct or not, um, but I have some pretty good faith in it because when we look at the other things, we can see we're not doing a lot of GC here, which is, is the strange part. There's a very infrequent G GC, but the duration of each of these GC events is huge, right? 14 seconds, this is enormous. Um, so, and it's constant, right? So it's constantly doing 14 second GCs. I don't really know why, but in any case, of, of an hour, it's spent 14 minutes um, doing GC so far. So I guess we could use that to test my formula here, but. Um, it, the formula doesn't really matter. The intention is to give you a percentage, an indicator that you can understand how healthy the JVM is in the time that it's spending doing garbage collection versus actually running the workload. And here it's not running the workload, right? So um, I don't really know what's going on here, but if we kind of continue down, you can see heap used is only like 600 megabytes. So it doesn't actually need to clear up any space. And that's why I don't really understand what's going on here. Um, but this is a little bit suspicious here. We've got a buffer pool of like one megabyte, which is pretty low. Um, the other environments, it's way higher, like 432. And, and this is pretty much pegged. Uh, flat out. If we kind of look at it over time, it's slowly creeping up. But um, 
in any case, this is a good example of identifying that there's a problem with the running JVM. Um, as you know, here we have more and more threads that are waiting, building up, um, and so the application performance here is is most likely going to be pretty bad, and uh, we need to dig in and figure it out. And and this is one of the reasons why I built this dashboard is you know oftentimes when we think about poor application performance, people start looking in logs, looking all around at the application, what's going on, but. If the JVM is running, uh, not running performantly, then it doesn't really matter what the application is doing. You're not going to find any log messages that say, hey, I'm running slowly because of this particular reason. Uh, and so sometimes we have to kind of take a step back and look at the runtime environment. And and here we can see that the, the JVM itself is whatever, whether it be poorly configured, uh, inappropriate resources, or whatever the reason may be, um, you know, this is something where the application running is is likely just fine. It's just it's being constrained at a different at a different level. Um, that's all I had for you today. I hope that uh, is valuable and. Um, these, uh, these dashboards uh, and configuration files are obviously going to be made available publicly um, uh, and uh, links to them will be included in the um, video description. Have a great day.